coming up next on the Passion Struck Podcast. The critical piece to meditation, it's the mechanism that we refer to, meta awareness, which is just awareness of awareness. So knowing where your mind is at any point, rather than getting sucked into the process of thinking and reactivity associated with that, you're disidentifying from that internal negative experience, and you have reduced reactivity to the content of those thoughts. That meta awareness and decentering process is the key to improving and optimizing how your mind can then uh, function. Welcome to Passion Struck. Hi, I'm your host, John R. Miles. And on the show, we decipher the secrets, tips, and guidance of the world's most inspiring people and turn their wisdom into practical advice for you and those around you. Our mission is to help you unlock the power of intentionality so that you can become the best version of yourself. If you're new to the show, I offer advice and answer listener questions on Fridays. We have long form interviews the rest of the week with guests ranging from astronauts to authors, CEOs, creators, innovators, scientists, military leaders, visionaries, and athletes. Now, let's go out there and become passion struck. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to episode 123 of passion struck one of the top health and education podcasts in the world. Thank you to all of you who come back weekly to listen and learn how to live better, be better and impact the world. And if you missed last week's episodes, our guest was the one and only Susan Kane. And during our interview, we launched her new masterpiece, Bittersweet, How Sorrow and Longing Make Us Whole. It was a truly phenomenal episode. And my Momentum Friday show focused on the science behind how we learn. Please check them both out and consider giving us a five-star rating and review. We absolutely love to hear from our audience and so do our guests. And speaking of upcoming guests, I wanted to announce that we are doing the official book launch for the duo behind the super popular Liz and Molly comics who have a new book, Big Feelings, How to Be Okay When Things Are Not Okay. And it and the episode will both release on Tuesday, April 26. Definitely another episode like today's amazing guest who you absolutely don't wanna miss. Speaking of our guest today, I am truly ecstatic to welcome Dr. David Vago to our show, who is one of the foremost experts in the world on meditation and has been studying it for over 20 years. He is a research associate professor and director of the contemplative neuroscience Science and Mind Body Research Laboratory in the Department of Psychology at Vanderbilt University. He is also part of the faculty for the Vanderbilt Brain Institute and Vanderbilt Institute for Infection, Immunology, and Inflammation. Dr. Vago maintains a research associate position in the Functional Neuroimaging Laboratory, Brigham and Women's Hospital, Harvard Medical School, and is also a research lead for the mental health and well being platform, Brown Glass, and a Mind and Life. Institute Fellow. Today, we discuss how the study of meditation became his life's work and his pursuit in academia, how his work with the Mind and Life Institute created the avenue for him to actually meet and interact multiple times with the Dalai Lama. And we'll also talk about the challenge that the Dalai Lama gave Dr. Vago to pursue, why his goal is to put an end to human suffering and the importance of meta awareness in that pursuit. We discuss the enormous value that meditation can have for our health, his study of the adaptive mind-brain-body interactions in humans. He describes the work that contemplative science is undertaking and its role in understanding human flourishing and transcendence. Thank you for choosing Passion Struck and choosing me to be your host and guide on your journey to creating an intentional life. Now, let that journey begin. Thank you so much, Dr. Vago, for coming today. Uh, great to be with you, John. It's really a pleasure. Well, I thought a great starting point for the audience would be to go into your background of how does someone make meditation and the study of it their lifelong purpose? 
It's a great question. When I started studying meditation back only in probably 2004, formally, there wasn't a lot of people doing that kind of research. In fact, it wasn't really popular. It wasn't um, accepted as a, an area of study that would really provide much empirical data. I came out of a neuroscience program, um, a cognitive neuroscience program in the University of Utah, in my graduate training. At the same time, I was also a meditation practitioner. I've been meditating since the 90s. Uh, it was a personal interest of mine as I was always interested in the mind brain uh, and its influence on um, health and healing. And so because of that interest, it was just natural for me to also explore some of the um, the more contemplative or wisdom-based traditions that focus on nurturing um, the inner mind, the inner self, um, and reflecting inwardly through meditation practice. And so my investigations into Buddhism and Vedanta, uh, different so Buddhist and Hindu uh, approaches to understanding the mind was a complement to studying the Western approach of mind and brain. And it gave me first person experience into the profound shifts, transformative capacity for, uh, through meditation that um, I always was you know, open to the idea of studying it. But it wasn't until uh, I met uh, probably one of my earlier mentors, Richie Davidson, who's at the University of Wisconsin, who had started doing this kind of work focused on studying advanced meditators, practitioners of meditation, Buddhist meditation in um, the context of uh, neuroimaging. So looking, taking these really advanced practitioners, putting them in the context of a uh, fMRI or MRI scanner, uh, which is a big magnet that really can just uh, uh, not only look at the structure of the brain, but can also look at functional activity of the brain and he basically inspired me that this is a possible niche that I could also fill, that I can be part of. So I uh, worked with him and an organization called the Mind and Life Institute, which was started by um, uh, Francisco Varela, who's a neuroscientist, um, a businessman that came from Harvard Business School, Adam Engel, um, and the Dalai Lama. <laughs> and so what a combination, right? So with the Dalai Lama's intention to explore Western approaches to the mind, um, which would be, he was even open to neuroscience informing uh, the spiritual tradition of the Buddhist path. Uh, there was an opening to really have a large impact on for humanity and watch how Buddhist sort of conceptions of mind could also inform uh, more Western approaches to you know, in a therapeutic context, so psychiatric context, right? How do, how do you help people with anxiety and depression through the lens of meditation? And that just started to build in probably from 2004 to, to, to the current day, it's increased exponentially. If you look at the number of, of grants and, and research that's out there right now, it's, it's, it's dramatic in terms of what has been done only in the last 20 years. And I have been there along the way through my work with the Mind and Life Institute. I got to, you know, not only be around the Dalai Lama, but around a lot of great scientists like Richard Davidson, Daniel Goldman, John Kabat-Zinn, um, and then great practitioners like um, uh, Yonggi Mingyur Rinpoche, uh, uh, a different, a whole number of Rinpoches and, 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 and Buddhist teachers um, contemporary Buddhist teachers like Shinzen Young, Sharon Salzberg, Joan Halifax, Joseph Goldstein, you know, all these great teachers and scholars all trying to better understand how the mind can work to um, not just heal itself through a lot of the, the issues that, that come up in a psychiatric setting, but to empower it right through this power of intentionality through this power of um, awareness um, and acceptance and embodiment to move ourselves in a trajectory that is adaptive uh, and unraveling sort of the sense of self that could be 
harmful or maladaptive. And so that, that, that's always been my inspiration because as a practitioner, you're always also trying to do service for others, trying to give back what you can. And so my science has been really about the motivation to reduce suffering um, through the lens of studying rigorously the mind brain body complex. So that, that through that motivation, I've moved from uh, studying basic neuroscience of learning and memory in rats to um, working at Weill Cornell Medical School to Harvard Medical School, and then being recruited back in 2016 to, to drive a research infrastructure at a uh, Vanderbilt University Medical Center um, at an integrative med medicine clinic. So that has sort of culminated into where I am today, um, both at an academic standpoint, where I focus on studying um, med the basic neurobiological mechanisms by which meditation functions. Um, and then it's also allowed me to pivot a bit uh, and work with the for-profit sector where I, I'm the research lead for a for-profit company called Round Glass that's not only bringing meditation content to the world, but, but everything from um, nutrition, uh, social well-being, uh, physical well-being, right? And all the dimensions are, or pillars of well-being that we can focus on that, that, that leverages meditation as a central component. So now we have, so now I'm at a point where I have the academic sort of standing to help really understand the mechanisms by which these functions or these practices work to improve people's well-being. I'm in a for-profit world where I can sort of make sure that what people are getting in the commercial um, side of, of, of this industry is done rigorously and in an authentic way. And we're just starting a new society called the International Society for Contemplative Research that is bringing the community of scholars and practitioners um, and even the for-profit sector together to really build this um, way of experiencing the world um, through the lens of, of well-being um, in a rigorous way. So there's a lot of components that have, have manifested for me on this path. Uh, and I'm just really grateful to be embedded in it, helping to lead the, the direction for how we can really use our sense of self and our own mental capacity to improve our, our health and well-being. Oh, what an incredible background. And I think a great example for this audience of how once you unlock your purpose and really follow it, um, how far it can take you in life and how intentional you've been through each of these progressions and then the universe has kind of rewarded you for just keeping down this path. So I thought something I heard on another podcast was, was pretty funny. Um, and I'll just relate this in a personal story. When I was a junior or senior in high school, I had an English teacher that everyone loved. Um, and one time I went to her for career advice on where I should go to college. And her response is something I will never forget. She said, John, it doesn't matter where you go to college because you are never going to be successful in life. <laughs> but um, where I wanted to relate this is you had an academic mentor tell you yeah. that you would never be successful in academia studying meditation. So mm -hmm. I, think, I think they're both good lessons to take input that you hear from others but trust your gut um, on your journey. Completely, 100%, I agree. I'm not gonna say that my path hasn't had obstacles. Um, it has, uh, but when you believe in something strongly and feel that there's meaning behind it, that you um, have that sense of purpose behind it, there's no stopping, right? There's no way that it can, that any obstacle can be a roadblock, right? There's gradual influence that you can have over time. Um, and as you can see from just looking out at the, the marketplace now, mindfulness, I mean, is a, it's a commercial industry now. You see it everywhere. For your listeners, it's important to think about trusting your gut. My mentor in graduate school would look on my bookshelf and see all these books on Buddhism. 
more books of Buddhism than neuroscience. And he would complain like, Dave, you know, you're, you're never going to get anywhere with this Zen stuff. You need to really think about focusing on neuroscience and not meditation. But I saw it, there's a real overlap there about how meditation is a way to influence our own neurobiology. And we know there's plenty of work now to show that a particular mindset, for example, just how we see the world uh, and how we see our own health, how we identify with our own health and illness can influence our health outcomes, right? So there's work by Aliyah Crum uh, that focuses on stress enhancing versus um, um, uh, well, stress enhancing mindset versus um, a stress debilitating mindset. What she's found, one interesting finding, for example, is just by thinking that stress has a negative impact on your health and well being can lead to almost a somewhere between like 60 to 70% increased risk of dying prematurely just by thinking and orienting towards your own health and well being in a negative way. And you think about you know, the people. I don't know if you watched the Olympics recently, but a lot of stress to perform on that one run, ski run, or that on the ice for that one time is very stressful. And how do you perform at your optimized capacity? You know, you've done this like a hundred, hundreds of times well, but now is the, the opportunity to do it in this one shot. How do you get out of your way? How do you make sure that your body performs and is in that flow, in that zone, that, that optimum state of performance without letting your mind bring you down because it can often interfere with your ongoing task demands if you start mind wandering and thinking about other things. And so meditation really just provides a, a way to um, optimize your, uh, your sort of your, your path uh, in front of you so you can just be aware of experiences without thinking about them and letting them interfere with with your performance well i am going to relate a story to you and it just occurred to me that um, i thought the first time i had really um, practiced meditation was when i was with seal team 10 uh, because at the time they were training us both using yoga and mind control and breathing to be better present in the moment for operations. But as I look back upon my life, um, when I was probably a junior in high school, um, I was a cross country and track runner, and I really wanted um, to do well and to be able to go on and, and run in college. And I was having these difficulties when I would get to races that I would get so nervous that it would at times ruined the race for me. And it wasn't until I started to really started sitting with myself and started to visualize the outcome that I wanted and how I wanted to feel when I started the race and how I was going to feel throughout it, that things started to change. And I ended up doing that um, almost on a daily basis where I would just sit with myself for five to 15 minutes and I had all these visual cue cards, but I would just close my eyes and imagine the result that I wanted. And through that, I ended up achieving my goal of, of running in college. But it's why, as you look at um, hmm. this science, because when you started, and I heard this on another episode, there were literally dozens or maybe 50 or 60 articles on this. Now there's 9,000, but I heard you reference that out of the 9,000, only 1,600 of them are really solid in their basis. Why is it so hard to define meditation? Mm, yeah, great question. There is a lot of good science and bad science. I think people often forget that science is incremental in how it, it sort of provides support and evidence for anything, really. So it takes time. And so often, because the beginning of a field uh, and big field of study requires a lot of um, what we call pilot research, where you say, hey, does, is this even feasible? Can we even do a meditation intervention for people 
that people feel safe, that it works and it's implemented in a secular context that people don't have any issues with it. And then you just look at that first and you say, does that work? That takes a few years, right? Then you have these studies that show, and you do that with different populations. Then you have to show in a single arm trial, which means you just looking at one population, let's say people with chronic pain, and you say, does this practice or this intervention that we've now determined is safe and feasible, does it actually improve outcomes at all? Like, does it improve the pain or the ability to cope with the pain? Does it improve the sleep problems that people have? And the questions have been posed in that way from probably 2005 to 2012. They're still going in that direction. Um, But what they found was indeed, a single arm trial will say, yes, it not only is safe and feasible, but now we can say that mindfulness in a, in a context of like an eight week program can improve health outcomes. That's wonderful. Now, then you have to do the next stage of research uh, clinical trials, which compare it to an active control. And you do, this is, comes from mostly of the work in with uh, drug studies that always you need a placebo or you need some other drug to compare it to. So you can have these comparative effectiveness trials where it's let's compare the, now the intervention to the gold standard and the gold standard um, for treatment of anxiety and depression or pain, for example, has been something like cognitive behavioral therapy, um, which is a gold standard for treating most psychopathologies. So if you, if you start to compare it to the gold standard um, or, or a controlled intervention that tries to match the elements of the intervention that are what we call non-specific, like you just being in a group setting uh, or um, the amount of time you spend reading or paying attention to something, all of that, or the charisma of a teacher, all of that's non-specific. We think that the active ingredient is really sitting and meditating, right? So we take everything out, we compare it to each other. We say, here's this control, um, group that people are going to participate in. And we compare the health outcomes and, and biological mechanisms to the uh, intervention, which in this case would be a mindfulness-based intervention. And we now know that there's a good, good evidence base for an eight-week program called mindfulness-based stress reduction or mindfulness-based cognitive therapy and a, and a few variations of that. And the data is showing that not only is it as good as some of the gold standard treatments like CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. But in some cases, it outperforms those. That took 15 years, at least, just to get to that point. And now we're trying to say, well, can we actually modify those interventions to optimize how it's delivered in a personalized way? There are there some people that benefit from doing specific meditations over others? Are there some people that benefit um, from uh, doing it in longer dosages or more intense practice. Um, and we don't have those answers yet. So operationalizing mindfulness was hard enough. John Kabat-Zinn says mindfulness is described as paying attention in a particular way uh, in the present moment and non-judgmentally. And that's been sort of the operationalization of how what mindfulness is, for example. But we know that meditation is more than that. We know that when you sit, like the word, uh, the Sanskrit word for meditation, bhavana, uh, is describes uh, cultivating familiarity with one's own mind. That's really what meditation refers to. It also comes from the Sanskrit dihayana. Um, these are words that um, were coming from like the sixth century BCE. Right, meditation only was, is an English word that translated the Sanskrit from so long ago. Um, It's also used in the Old Testament, um, but all of it's been about learning how to either gain awareness or insight into the nature of one's mind or to connect with the divine. The nature of mind from the Buddhist perspective can be similarly compared to connecting with an experience of God. Uh, And so if you look at theological traditions of contemplation, um, even from the you know, Christian traditions, uh, contemplation has involved um, connecting with something greater than oneself. And so that's when we start to 
realize that it's not just about decreasing stress or improving our attention, but there's something that is even more um, meaningful for people when they do this kind of practice that they connect with not only um, let's just say they dissolve the boundaries between self and other so to, to improve our connection with others around us, but to be more transcendent of our own self identity and connecting with something greater than the self, something like nature or the divine. And that is where I think that you get the most impact for these practices because they help not only unravel the negative sort of aspects of self identity, that could be things like depression, anxiety, or distraction, but they lead to something greater like purpose and meaning, like finding your path, finding a way to connect with others and improve humanity. You recently published an article with some of the biggest contemporaries I could think of around self-transcendent experience, including Dr. Yaden, uh, Ralph Hood from Chattanooga, where my parents are from, Jonathan Haidt and Andrew Newberg, yes. some esteemed company. And what I wanted to, to ask you, if you could talk about meta-awareness, I thought it was interesting how you all talked about self-transcendent experiences, but I was specifically caught up in awe versus mm. peak experiences to mythism. I thought that could be a good topic uh, to talk about, how meta-awareness in those three things, which to me have some overlap, occurs. Yeah, I'm happy. If we go start with self-transcendence and this idea that there is something to transcend, the self has, if the self is something that is created through, say, time, right? Over time, you have certain um, thoughts and emotions that basically construct your own self-identity. It constructs it, it, what we, we refer to this as a, a clinical model of self-reification, right? Conditioning, habit formation. This all leads to how we conceptualize our identity, our needs, our wants, our fears, our expectations, our attitudes, our values, our whole worldview is constructed um, and our view of reality becomes embedded in this reified sense of self, like who we are. Um, and that takes time, right? So the, when, we, when we start to introspect or look into our own patterns of thinking and start to see things like, you know, um, thoughts like um, I'm not good enough or um, I am sick, I am depressed, I am anxious. These are very common thoughts that people have and they are um, overwhelming. They can be debilitating um, and they can um, really harm someone's motivation for, for action. And there's a great um, saying by the Buddha that comes from the Dhammapada, which is a collection of, 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 of sayings by the Buddha. It says, our life is shaped by our mind, for we become what we think. Right? And the idea there is that the more we, we have these sort of recurring thoughts of I'm sick, I'm sick, I'm sick, I'm sick, uh, or I'm depressed, I'm anxious, whatever those are, those are negative negatively oriented thoughts about oneself. And they are what reify the self identity into a sick, depressed, anxious, angry person. Um, and so what meditation does, it allows you to create a distance with your with those thoughts. And that distance, we sometimes refer to it as a psychological distance. Um, sometimes we refer to it um, as decentering practice. So you're decentering away from your own thoughts and you're holding the thought in front of you and realizing that that thought, I am sick, I am unwell, I am not good enough, is just a thought. Because if you let it overwhelm you, it takes over your whole physiology, it becomes part of your identity and you can't escape it, right? And this idea of transcending the self um, you know, William James once said, we can experience union with something larger than ourselves. And in that union, find our greatest peace. And that is what we're talking about is, is not only having the distance between yourself and your thoughts 
So you have awareness and it's sort of a safe place to be, but you're then creating union with something greater than ourselves. And that's where we'll find not only optimizing our, our, uh, our performance, but um, we'll find a sense of purpose and meaning. But the, the key is the meta awareness which piece, which is meditation trains your brain, trains your mind and brain together to allow you to see, create a distance between those thoughts. And it does two things. The first thing it does is it allows you to be non-reactive, right? So if you have a thought, I'm not good enough, I'm sad, I'm angry, I'm depressed, those thoughts can actually lead to a stress response. They can lead to inflammation across many pathways of your body and leads to um, uh, um, re results in a lot of um, cardiovascular uh, forms of disease and dysfunction. Um, and that can be debilitating. And it leads to what we call inflammaging. Um, <laughs> you have a trajectory in life where your brain and body um, uh, start to degrade and atrophy over time. Um, and that's just part of the aging process. But if it's filled with lots of these negatively oriented thoughts, it could increase the, um, the rate at which it ages. In, in, and at the cellular level, you can have degeneration happening much faster with just thinking in a negatively oriented way. So if you take your stresses, and we talked about this a little earlier about mindset, if you take your stresses um, and see it as a challenge and are able to successfully have this sort of level of meta awareness where the thought is out here, right? Then that just that distance allows you to then transcend that identity that sort of gets embedded into this reified negatively oriented uh, structure, uh, uh, allows you to be non-reactive and allows you to um, have a sense of um, you can think of it as dissociative from that self-identity and just see things with awareness. So you break things down, like whether you have anger or anxiety, fear or sadness, you can break that down into just sensations, thoughts, and emotional tone, for example, just noting that they are sens that there are sensations in the body, that there are thoughts that you're having in your mind, and that they have a particular emotional valence, whether they're negative or positive. And that is the, the critical piece to meditation. It's the mechanism that we refer to, meta-awareness, which is just awareness of awareness. So knowing where your mind is at any point, rather than getting um, sucked into the, the, the process of thinking and reactivity associated with that, you're disidentifying from that internal negative experience and you have reduced reactivity to the content of those thoughts. That meta awareness and decentering process is the key to improving and optimizing how your mind can then uh, function. Well, I'm gonna take this um, through a couple more stories and recent occurrences that I've had uh, um, sure. because I think it, it ties hand in hand to this concept of what we imagine we create for ourselves. Um, so I recently met um, a neurosurgeon who at one point was doing five to six surgeries a day until he discovered meditation and yoga. And now he has involved personalized medicine so much in what he's doing that it's gone down to one to two surgeries a week um, because he is finding that many of the things people are experiencing he can treat with personalized medicine. Guest on the podcast, Dr. Jay Lombard, who is a well-known neurologist um, in New Jersey. For him, he has said that fMRI has changed the game for how he is working with patients. And he is now, he said it allowed him to see into the soul of the person and convinced him that if nature is causing these neurological disorders that he could cure them naturally. And so he is now using natural means to cure things like ALS, Parkinson's, CTE, and other ailments. So mm. all of this is showing me that 
there is so much power in what you were talking about and in imagining what these alternate treatments can do for us. And so I just wanted to bring those up, maybe get your thoughts on those examples. Let's be really clear. The placebo response, for example, evoked by just people's mindset towards illness, right? And the potential for healing. It's really just how you, how you believe. You know, and this is where faith actually can be really powerful. And you can't deny, no, no physician would ever deny that faith in something can have a profound effect. I mean, we know that placebo has an estimated 60 to 90% of clinically significant benefit in conditions, including pain, anxiety, depression, asthma, things like cardiovascular disease, neurodegenerative disorders, immune deficiencies, and recovery from surgery. There's great evidence that placebo is important. And so placebo means believing, right? It's the, it's the mindset that you have towards your illness. It's not just something to, to dismiss. We also know there's an effect called the nocebo effect, where this is a particular mindset that, that you might have that illness is bad and that stress is bad and that, that I'm, going to be, um, I'm going through something really horrible. And that actually, that kind of mindset um, leads to negative health outcomes. So placebo and nocebo are both evidence that our orientation in our own perception of, of our health and well-being has an effect on our physiology, on directly on our physiology. That's really important to think that, that just how we perceive and think and the core sort of assumptions and expectations that we have about ourselves and how we interact with the world and our health and well-being can actually have a large impact, not only on our mental health, but on our physical health. So it's really uh, critical. And one thing that I wanted to say, some work that we're doing right now um, that speaks to these effects on neurodegenerative disorders like, like ALS and Parkinson's is we are investigating at Vanderbilt um, what's called glymphatic flow in the brains of uh, people who have Parkinson's disease uh, and MS and people who are advanced meditators. And we look at this system and gl the glymphatic system. And then glymphatic system is, is a basically a waste removal system. It's associated with the glial cells in your brain that help support, remove the debris, that the gunk in the system that, that accumulates over time. And it's, it's basically a portal between the, your ner uh, um, nervous system and your vascular system in the brain. It's basically a connection between those you know, all the, 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 the neural uh, um, debris that needs to be removed over time, it goes through the blood and then it gets removed and circulates through um, uh, this glymphatic system. You actually see um, your cerebral spinal fluid moving in different parts of the sinal, sinuses um, and it, it is circulating out through the aqueduct and out into your blood system and then through your liver, it gets um, removed from the body. Now, what, what we've seen and this is recently, only in the last like seven years, people started looking at the system in the brain. And what we've seen is that um, sleep, for example, is uh, a critical restorative part of our experience to, to increase that glymphatic flow and allow you to remove that debris. So what we're finding is that often the people who have these neurodegenerative disorders have very disturbed sleep as they get older and the disturbances that they have in sleep, if it's not corrected, can actually lead to decreased removal or decreased lymphatic flow, decreased levels of, of remove, removing of the debris. Right. And then you have accumulation buildup of plaques and tangles, for example, in Alzheimer's disease, um, and, um, uh, you know, uh, problems with um, uh, neural functioning in general. So there is a really good association now with better outcomes when you can improve people's sleep and therefore directly improve the glymphatic flow. And the study that we're doing right now also is looking at how meditation can improve glymphatic flow. So we're seeing that, that meditation can actually 
uh, mimic some of the restorative effects of sleep. So if your sleep isn't very good, but you're doing some meditation during the day, you're also improving the ability to clear out the system. So that's one, another specific mechanism by which meditation can help improve um, not only the way you're thinking about the world and these mindsets to help leverage that placebo effect and decrease the nocebo effect, but can directly affect part of your brain's system of clearing debris. So all of that is then leading to decreased infl inflammatory pathways across you know, the brain and body and improved health outcomes. So it's, it's, it's dramatic what we can do with just meditation and mindsets. Yeah, it's incredible. And I am going to have to introduce you to Dr. Lombard because this is what he's been studying over the last decade and applying. Um, so it, it backs up um, a lot of the research he's doing and what he talked about on the podcast and making, you know, real life changes in people who were facing, you know, death defying disease. So I'm so glad you brought that up. Um, I'm going to take this um, to a little bit lighter area. Um, okay. The chances of me interviewing two people back to back who have met the Dalai Lama is got to be one in a million. But yesterday I, I interviewed uh, the author Gretchen Rubin, who had the opportunity to, to meet him. She's the author of a number of bestsellers, inclu including The Happiness Project. But I understand when you met him that he gave you a mission. So I kind of wanted to hear uh, what is one, what is it like meeting the Dalai Lama? Because I, I heard you from others that you feel a presence when you're around him. And then what, what um, mission did he give you? Yeah, I, thanks for going there. I um, feel very motivated by his holiness, the Dalai Lama and his efforts to make people um, realize how important compassion is compassion and bringing people into this non-dual state of awareness, which is we can dissolve the boundaries between ourselves and others. We realize, and you see this so often with human dynamics in the workplace or in a professional setting, people are always competitive with each other. It's just sort of naturally set up that way in society that we compete, especially in the academic world. There's always competition and you're always competing for grants and such. But the goal here is that we're all going to work together to improve humanity. And how do we do that? He's always been an inspiration for me. And um, because as a meditation practitioner, of course, he's one of the um, great teachers of the Tibetan Vajrayana path. So I've had the opportunity to meet with him a bunch of times through my work with the Mind and Life Institute. But there was a specific time where um, I got to present my work to him with a number of emerging leaders in the field of contemplative science and mindfulness research and meditation research. And he said basically that he looked at us and there was sort of a turning, a changing of the guard. There's some people who did some of this work in the 70s and they're sort of moving in towards the retirement phase maybe or just starting to look for legacy um, leaving their legacy with newer generation of, of scientists who focus on meditation and mindsets and, you know, really better doing the rigorous work that needs to be done for the future. And he says, now you and your generation, he was talking to six of us um, that were in his presence, you and your generation have the responsibility to build a happy, peaceful world. It's hard for me to even say that knowing that right now Ukraine is being invaded uh, at this point, and there's a possibility for people to die in the context of war. But millions of people want a peaceful world. Um, they're just lacking the knowledge of how to do so, right? There's just these structures embedded in our world and in our society to compete with each other. But so few individuals show interest in actually doing the work and he was telling us month by month, year by year, you will gain awareness about these things, how to bring more conviction to others' minds with evidence to convince others. And he said, he will watch us <laughs> and whether we are uh, really helping to build a happy, peaceful world or not. Uh, and then he was um, 
joking and he's good. He's a good joker. He says, I'll be, I'll watch from either hell or heaven. Uh, if from hell, there's not much I can do, but if you do the wrong things, I'll come as a demon with horns and hunt you down. <laughs> but he really was just pl being playful and saying that we, you should constantly check your own motivation. Uh, so I have been continually motivated no matter which way I go, whether I stay in the academic path or work with others um, in the for-profit sector or in the context of this new society that we're building, I really am just trying to use my neuroscience skills and my own meditation practice to help inform people about the science, the rigor of, uh, in which we can say meditation can have a truly lasting impact uh, and help humanity in a positive way. Um, and that's really uh, the, the gist of it. It's really just a form of motivation for, for me. Well, I think that is a great segue um, to discuss a mutual friend of ours, Jeff Walker, who I had on the podcast. And uh, for those in the audience who aren't aware of it, um, UVA now has a contemplative science center um, that not only did, was Jeff involved in, he was the chairman of. And as I was looking at their mission, um, it struck me as, as really aspirational because they described their mission as the study and application of human flourishing. So I was hoping I could ask you about two things. If the audience doesn't understand what contemplative science is, maybe you could define it for them. And then, you know, through your own research and that and you're doing with other contemporaries, how do you think we can promote more human flourishing? Because I think it goes hand in hand with that challenge that the Dalai Lama gave you. Yeah, great, great question. So um, contemplative science is really defined as the scholarly and scientific investigation of contemplative practice. Um, and this really involves general techniques that focus attention in a sustained fashion um, with the aim of deepening states of concentration, tranquility, and insight. Um, this allows us to broaden our field of awareness, develop altruistic tendencies, including empathy and compassion, and selfless acts of love. Uh, so it can involve the study of intentional first-person phenomenology. Uh, so it can be common, uncultivated, spontaneous experiences of absorption, right, in any activity. It can be experienced in, a, in we, 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 you mentioned awe, the experience of awe, which can be a self-transcendent experience where you feel union with something greater than oneself and your own self, self-salience is diminished. And that experience of being lost in that moment, but so focused in the zone, right? We sometimes refer to it as flow. Csikszentmihalyi, the Hungarian psychologist, also talks about this idea of flow. Um, we've talked about it in that article that you referenced with um, David Yadin and uh, Jonathan Haidt and colleagues focusing on how awe and love, the selfless sort of acts of just connecting with something deeper than oneself um, can also be a contemplative experience, right? So it doesn't have to be just meditation and it doesn't have to be done in, you know, uh, uh, India or Nepal or in a cave or in a retreat setting. You can cultivate these, these deepening states of concentration and insight and broadening field of awareness right you know, in any moment that you have, even in, you know, waiting in line at the grocery store. Uh, you know, and it also involves philosophical inquiry into the nature of one's mind, into your own mental habits. We talked about the word bhavana earlier as a Sanskrit for meditation, which really refers to cultivating insight into your own mental habits. What, what are our, where does our mind go when we let it just, you know, wander? Uh, and so not only is contemplation involving this intentional first person phenomenology that's um, that focuses on absorption in an activity, but it can also be lead to the most profound experiences that are deliberate, intentional, systematically cultivated through, through systematic training of the mind uh, through meditation. So that, that gives you, should give a sense of what kind of contemplative science really aims to investigate. Um, it really focuses on mind and body practices, which 
is a large and diverse group of techniques that, that involves uh, training the mind or integration of embodied, embedded, or an inactive uh, forms of cognition. And this is a, a new field of cognition that focuses on uh, better understanding the differences between experiencing the world through your own sensory um, experience without expectations. Um, in being more embodied means to, to experience the world with your body. So finding places like um, your shoulders where maybe you're having an emotional experience, a feeling state of tension or stress, and then really just being in your body rather than in your head. And that's an, what we refer to as an embodied experience. And, you know, and the idea here is that, you know, things like meditation, yoga, tai chi, qigong, these are all mind-body practices that fit into uh, the areas of contemplative research. Um, it can also involve the investigation of aspects of well-being, including a sense of purpose and meaning, ways of knowing and experiencing the world, feelings of gratitude and forgiveness, and philosophical understandings of one's own self um, and the nature of our own suffering. So suffering and suffering from the Buddhist perspective really refers to this continual act of dissatisfaction, right? It's, we all suffer, we all have stress, but if we're always dissatisfied with our current state of affairs, then that is, um, there is a, there is a, a direct um, anecdote to that, which is awareness and focusing and cultivating awareness. So you can see that dissatisfaction and move beyond it. Right. So contemplative research really involves a lot of the focus on these contemplative practices that really um, deepen concentration, tranquility and insight. Okay. I think that's great for the audience to, to understand. And I would encourage them to look at that center the center that's at Stanford, what you're doing at Vanderbilt, what's going on in Harvard, because there are some just amazing um, research organizations and academic institutions that are really focusing on this important topic. Now, I wanted to talk about uh, Dhammapada, which you brought up earlier, which is basically we become what we think. Yeah. Um, and I use this for the last chapter I wrote um, in my book that's coming out this summer. And the title of the chapter is really about conscious engagement. And as I started to think about this, and why do so many people fail to achieve change in their life? Mm. It really got me thinking about the comparison between being spontaneously engaged and consciously engaged. And I liken it to a pinball machine, where when you're spontaneously engaged, you're kind of like the ball bouncing off the items without any direction. But if you really learn how to play the game of pinball and you're consciously engaged with it, you can learn how to play the game instead of having it play you. And I think the same is true with life. So I think our lives are made not by the peak experiences, but I call them the everyday transition points that we interact with that really define who we are, how we're living to our core values, et cetera. Just wanted to ask, why do so many people spontaneously engage instead of consciously engage in their lives? It's a great question. And it speaks directly to, you know, the motivations that we have for behavior. Um, a lot of what my work has shown is that there's particular biases that we all have um, and tendencies for particular mental habits uh, that, that are conditioned over time. And if we want to move towards something that is adaptive, and if we know that what we fill our mind with has an impact on our own health and, and uh, health outcomes, that we have to think about the model of what a flourishing human being is like, right? To live within this optimal range of human functioning to think about, um, there's usually four components that are described in some models for flourishing, like um, goodness, um, uh, generativity, growth, and resilience. And, you know, this 
idea comes from the you know, Greek uh, term that Aristotle used called eudaimonia to represent the highest human good on the aim of right action, state of having sort of a good indwelling spirit, a contented state of being healthy, happy, and prosperous. If we put our intentionality into that orientation of, of goodness, generativity, growth, and resilience, we find that you can generate meaning and purpose much more readily. That meaning and purpose is what drives uh, well-being outcomes to be the, the you know, the, the most uh, uh, impactful and um, uh, um, most readily um, uh, going to improve th th that scale of like just where you are um, um, having a, a sense of just overall well-being across the different domains of your life. Meaning and purpose are like key to that um, aspect of well-being. And so that means, you know, being pro-social, it means being optimistic. It means really res respecting the people around you everybody's suffering right from mental illness or or from some sort of uh, problem in the world there's plenty of them to choose from <laughs> uh, but that that it's sort of within the range of human experience and that we sort of are looking for a sense of joy even in this even in the most challenging times uh, and that we're looking to um, have sort of these um, instead of stress, response to many of the challenges that we have, the stressors that we have, we are thinking about in terms of the generative sort of component would be thinking about or orienting towards challenges in a playful way, in a, in, in a curious way. Um, and that sort of helped broaden some of these thought um, and action, uh, what we call repertoires or sort of ways to generate behavior in a positive way. And then resilience really and growth really refer to the gains that you you get through enduring um, uh, or really just cultivating personal and social resources, right? So creating community, um, uh, creating flexibility around a lot of your your behaviors, and then growth, survival in the aftermath of the adversity. That's where we have we we have resilience. And a lot of that re requires um, a few different strategies, things like positive reappraisal, right? Reframing how you're experiencing something. If you are in Ukraine today, you know, you are facing a lot of stress and adversity. How do you, how do you emerge from that, right? How do these people, how will they emerge from this in a positive way? So every adversity is also an opportunity to um, survive and grow. Uh, uh, you know, of course, you can't always escape um, some, some of the challenges, right? And, but if you think about, for example, the best example is there are these Tibetan monks who were tortured by Chinese uh, officials um, in some of the... Um, some of what's political sort of aftermath of, of Tibet being broken up politically by China. Um, I, I've witnessed some of these monks who talk about their experience of being tortured and they say that they have compassion for their torturers. And you think about that and you say, how is it possible that these people who, who you know, did hor horrific acts towards you and your body that you can still have love, you know, un that's unconditional for them. And that sort of orientation is the most dramatic form of reframing or positive reappraisal that yet you can imagine, right? So you're, instead of letting the negative frame of being, I am, I'm a victim and I am, I'll never be the same anymore. You know, that's not going to help you survive and grow. The only way forward is to reframe it in a positive way that allows you to then um, uh, cultivate 
you know, something, a more positive mood state and move and grow from that particular experience. So that's the, the positive reappraisal part. Then there's another aspect of, of, of resilience and growth and flourishing that I wanted to mention, which is now in some of these evidence-based protocols that involve mindfulness, like uh, mindfulness-oriented recovery enhancement by, developed by Eric Garland, shows that you can savor. If you savor the things that are positive in your life, that you can rest your awareness in something, even in the most you know, difficult, challenging times, if you savor the, the positive aspects of even something simple, like, like something beautiful, like a sunset, just sitting in that awareness of the, of the beauty of a sunset can allow you to grow and move towards this state of flourishing. And that's, um, again, so just to reiterate, flourishing is a model in which you have optimal human functioning. And it's, if, you can care, if you can cultivate this element of positive reframing and, and savoring, you can optimize a sense of goodness. Generativity comes from just um, playing and exploring instead of reacting and fighting um, towards these stressors. Growth really is a manifestation of this, these positive mindsets because you're going to grow as a result of doing these sort of reframing and savoring sort of techniques. And that's going to allow you to be resilient, indexed by your survival and growth in the aftermath of adversity. I think that's a one helpful way to think about um, not allowing the, the negative oriented thoughts or mindsets to take over your self identity. And I recently had a guest on it was one of the most inspirational episodes I've ever recorded. It was with Jen Bricker Bauer, who was born without legs, something that she said just really hit me. And that's that everyone is faced with struggles and obstacles. It's the one equalizer that we all have. And you can sit there and look at the negative aspect or the positive. Her life, she has always had this everything is possible mentality, which has now allowed her to be a New York Times bestselling writer, performer, and inspiration to millions so many. So I think that goes hand in hand with what you just said. Um, so I have, I typically do a lightning round, but you and I are out of town, time. So I am going to ask you one Quick question, because I, I love hearing the answer that people give to this. And that is, if someday you were selected to be one of the first people to walk on Mars and you were allowed to give one law, regulation, whatever it might be for this new world, what would it be? Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> one law about, um, so a new society, right? This is kind of, I think maybe there would be an element of gratitude practice. What are you grateful for today? Not necessarily a rule, but a uh, suggestion of how we can be grateful for the things that we have and where we're going to preserve humanity. Something about maintaining a gratitude practice would be something I would ask people to try to do. Okay. I think that's a great way to end. I would just give you the opportunity that if someone wants to learn more about you, and I would encourage them to check out your TED talk because it's one of the best I've ever seen. Uh, what are some other ways that they could contact or find out more about you? Contemplative neurosciences.com is my personal website. They can also go to contemplativeresearch.org to learn more about the new society. And then if they want to learn some, get some great content that focuses on the broad spectrum of well-being, they can go to round.glass. Okay. Well, Dr. Vago, this was just an incredible interview. So thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with our audience. It's great to be with you, John. And I, I yeah, look forward to uh, reconnecting in the future, uh, hopefully before we start populating Mars. Uh, yes. but, uh, but uh, it's been great to be with you and your audience. Uh, really a pleasure. What an amazing interview that was with Dr. David Vago, and I hope you appreciated it as much as I did. And if you're new to the show or you would just like to tell a friend or family member about it, we now have episode starter packs, both 
on our website and on Spotify. These are collections of your favorite episodes that we organize by topic to give any new listener a great way to get acquainted to everything that we do here on the show. Just go to passionstruck.com slash starter packs to get started. And if you'd like to watch today's interview, in addition to listening to it, we also have our YouTube channel at John R. Miles with over 260 videos. Please go there, subscribe and check it out. And coming up, we have some great additional guests coming on the show, including New York Times bestselling author Gretchen Rubin, astronaut Nicole Stott, Hurt leadership extraordinaire Trisha Manning, Jordan Harbinger, Kathy Heller, and also in a few weeks after that, Dr. David Yaden, who is a contemporary peer of today's guest, Dr. David Vago. And if there is a guest that you would like to see us interview here on the show, you can reach out to us at Instagram at John R. Miles or on our LinkedIn page at John Miles. And if there's a topic that you would like me to cover in our Momentum Friday episodes, which come out every single Friday, you can email us at Momentum Friday at passionstruck.com and please put a unique subject so it catches our attention and please lay out concisely what it is that you would like us to talk about and what issue you may need us to solve. Now, go out there and live life passion struck. Thank you so much for joining us. The purpose of our show is to make passion go viral. And we do that by sharing with you the knowledge and skills that you need to unlock your hidden potential. If you want to hear more, Please subscribe to the Passion Struck Podcast on Spotify, iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcasts at. And if you absolutely love this episode, we'd appreciate a five-star rating on iTunes and you sharing it with three of your most growth-minded friends so they can post it as well to their social accounts and help us grow our Passion Struck community. If you'd like to learn more about the show, and our mission, you can go to passionstruck.com where you can sign up for our, our newsletter, look at our tools, and also download the show notes for today's episode. Additionally, you can listen to us every Tuesday and Friday for even more inspiring content. And remember, make a choice, work hard, and step into your sharp edges. Thank you again for joining us. 